We covered a whole lot in the previous session, and we tried to talk about the anatomy of souls and the five levels of souls and how it all is concatenated together like little souls or little, or little chains in a link. I think we started talking about the soul subject because we want to talk about the soul and the afterlife. We're talking about the 13 principles of faith, and we're in principle number 11. And principle number 11 is reward and punishment, and specifically reward and punishment in the afterlife. And we thought it was prudent to talk about the soul, which is who we are in the afterlife. And we approached it, I think, maybe in a difficult way to talk about the, the anatomy, the makeup of the soul. Today, please God, we will expand on the subject and talk about the backstory and the origin of the soul and the creation of the soul and where they came from and what is their nature and what is their properties. And eventually we will please God continue to talk about the transpositioning of the soul and the long and interesting journey that the soul takes until it is wedded to the body until it's brought into this world and all the dynamics that emerge as a result of that. And the reason why we spend so much time on this fundamental subject is because, A, it is our subject here. If we're going to talk about the idea of reward and punishment in the afterlife in a serious way, we have to understand the soul. But in addition, it's not just useful information for the afterlife. When we study the subject of the soul, it reveals to us what is the primary conflict of life that we're here, what, what do we need to do for, what do we need to accomplish in this world, what is the nature of the situation in which our soul is placed over here. And therefore, any discussion on the fundamental principles of our faith must spend a lot of time and effort in understanding the soul to the best of our abilities. Now, last time we talked about the anatomy of the soul, and we went through a chapter in Derech Hashem, the way of God by Ramchal. And we spoke about the various levels of the soul and the five, and the five different components of the soul. And we spoke about how the lowest level is the nefesh, which is almost like the animal soul and how it connects to the body. And then we have a, upon that, we have a higher level which is the Ruach, and there's even a higher level called the Neshama. And by the way, please God, we will get to even a more nuanced take on this, please God, soon, how actually each one of these five levels of the soul is comprised of sub-components, just like you have the atom, and then there's these subatomic parts, there's the soul, and the sub-soul parts, and the sub-sub-soul parts. It is a very broad subject. But right now we know that there are five components of the soul and those correspond to the five similarities between God and the soul. So we have the nefesh, the ruach, the neshama. We mentioned last time, Rashi tells us that the nefesh, well, in that area, we are somewhat similar to animals. And that's because the nefesh relates to action. Animals have action as well. The ruach is a level higher and that is something the animals don't have. And that relates to speech, and the neshama, the level even higher than that, relates to thought, again, something that the animals don't have. Now, I didn't mention this last time, but just for the sake of accuracy, even though it may add confusion to a already confusing subject, it seems like Ramchal differentiates between the soul of the animal and the lowest level called the nefesh, which is actually not the soul of the animal. There is one nefesh, which is the nefesh that is similar to the animals, and then there is a human nefesh. According to Ramchal, there are two nefeshes. I just wanted to bring that out there because I want, just for the sake of accuracy. Now, it's interesting, after we spoke about this last time, it clarified for me perhaps a challenging piece in the Talmud. The Talmud in the book of Yoma on page 30, on page 29a, tells us that the thoughts of a sin are more destructive than the action of the sin itself. 
Hirhuri Avera, the thoughts of a sin are more stringent, more harsh, are kashu me'avera, are worse than the sin itself. So if you think about a sin, it's actually worse than doing the sin. But that doesn't make any sense, because, you know, thinking about something, that's not the action. We always think of the action as being the thing that matters. Someone's planning, someone's thoughts, someone's murmurings of their hearts. Those are not really real. I think according to this understanding, if the thoughts are operating on a higher level of our soul, and they're corruptive thoughts, well, if you're corrupting a higher part of your soul, that is actually more damaging and destructive than the implementation of those harmful thoughts, namely in the realm of action, which of course corrupts our soul, but a lower level of soul. So we have these three levels of the soul, and we talk about the even two higher levels that come from a different plane, and that's the Chaya and the Yechidan that have absolutely no relationship with the body, and we spoke about last time about how when you dream, certain parts of your soul or certain souls in your chain can unbind themselves from the chain and can explore the heavenly spheres above. And we spoke about the great sages of yore. Every night, whenever they would dream, they would visit the great academies of Rabbi Yishmolin, Rabbi Akiva, and Rabbi Shimon, and Rabbi Meir, and they would go study And the most impressive part about it is that when they would get back here, they would remember what they learned. And we spoke about how this understanding of the architecture of the soul, it explains, the Talmud tells us, that on Shabbos, a person gets an extra soul. It's like adding a pendant to a chain. If it's a chain, maybe you can add another soul and... That would explain the very unusual teaching in the Talmud that when Shabbos starts, you get an extra soul. And that would hit me. Maybe this was obvious to you. It hit me after we recorded that Ramchal tells us two ideas as a result of this structure of the soul. And I think they're really connected. So hear me out here. On Shabbos, you get an extra soul. When you sleep, some of, or at least potentially, that soul can unbind itself from the chain and you can potentially even experience higher worlds once your soul or parts of your soul are exploring the higher spheres. We're told in the literature that napping and sleeping on Shabbos is encouraged. It makes a lot of sense. If you have an extra soul on Shabbos, you have extra potential to explore things that are above your consciousness. It makes sense to allow more time for the exploration. It makes a lot of sense that we are encouraged to sleep on Shabbos, even though typically we say, you know, it's supposed to sleep less. Why? Because when you're asleep, you can't do mitzvahs, you can't study Torah. But on this dimension, if you have an extra soul, that means you have extra supernatural capacities that can only be unlocked in a, like a subconscious state. It makes sense to take it for a spin to take a nap on Shabbos. That was all in our previous episode, the first of our exploration of the soul. Today, I want to expand upon this subject give a little more color to the soul, to understand its nature, where it comes from, what is its essence, what is its power, what is its significance. And I want to begin by clearing away, by dispelling a terrible misconception. Now, the truth is, I kind of vacillated as to whether or not to discuss this. To discuss this or not to discuss it. On the one hand, there are good people, well-meaning people who have a terrible misconception about what the soul is. And therefore, it's important to address it. On the other hand, their position, their mistaken position, is so ridiculous, and if you haven't heard it before, if you haven't 
been poorly educated to have this mistaken belief, if it was just evaluating the question on the merits, it doesn't make any sense to address it. Why would we address such an infantile and incorrect position? It's not our policy to give every quack the light of day and to take every opinion as being equal and being equally legitimate. And maybe we shouldn't discuss it. Ultimately, I decided to debunk this fallacy because there are people, good people, who are serious about their spirituality and serious about their Judaism, yet have somehow been told something with insufficient nuance and insufficient precision and care. And as a result, these good people have adopted an opinion about the soul that is heretical. And therefore, we're going to address it, debunk it, and then explain what a soul actually is. Now, this opinion is widespread. So much so that I was once giving a talk and I asked the crowd of ostensibly fairly educated people a simple question. What is a soul? And a bunch of people in the audience said something that was so awful and so terrible and so wrong, so egregiously wrong, so heretical, I couldn't believe it. And it's important for us to dispel this terrible misconception. They gave an answer that's flat out heresy. Someone who has this opinion is repudiating a basic principle of our faith. Now, I want to stress, this is not malicious heresy. It's heresy born out of ignorance, but it's heresy nonetheless. Now, the reason why these people have this mistake, the reason for this terrible blunder, it's based upon a gross misunderstanding of an ancient Kabbalistic shorthand and a gross and incomplete reading of a famous Torah work. And this opinion, I believe, and we have the citations to prove it, this belief is so egregious that someone who holds this belief is disincluded from Olam Abba, which means to say they are heretics. It's an egregious violation of our belief system. This mistaken opinion is that the soul is a part of God. It's a part of Hashem. It's a piece of Hashem. That is straight up, flat out heresy. God is only one. Angels are not God. The Torah is not God. The soul is not God. People are not God. We believe Hashem, Echad, there's only one. And this God doesn't change. It's not comprised of parts, just one. We already saw this idea earlier on in the 13 Principles of Faith. God is one. This idea is incontrovertible if you look at the sources. So, for example, the Rambam. In the foundations of the Torah, he tells us our God, our deity, the creator of all, is only one, is not two, is not more than two, just one. And it's not even a one like the other ones that we are familiar with that can be broken down into parts. Your body is one, but you got lots of limbs and organs, please God, lots of different cells, lots of different atoms in it. There is a one that's unlike any other one that's indivisible into parts, says the Rambam. Not like one that is a collection, an amalgam of parts, and not like one that's like a body that's divisible into different domains, different sections, a one that there is no oneness, no singularity like this in the world. No body, no physicality, not welded or fused together in any way, cannot be divided or separated, has no up or down, or right or left, 
no front or back, no sitting or standing, is outside of time, has no beginning and no end, cannot change, nothing can cause God to change. That is the definition of God according to us. If someone claims that God has parts or is more than one, such a, per such a person, Ramam tells us, is ousted from our people. It's very serious stuff. These are not things we play games with. These are things we take very seriously. If you're going to talk about matters of theology, you have to be very precise. You cannot be flippant about these things. Says the Rambam. This is the laws of repentance. Earlier it was the laws of foundations of the Torah. This is the laws of repentance. He gives us a list of 13 categories of people that are forever excluded from the afterlife. Which again, by our standards, means they're done forever. The first of this category is minim, which means heretics. Well, what does that mean? The Ram gives us five categories of heretics. If you say that there is no God, an atheist, the world has no creator or guide. That's number one. Number two is someone who says the world does have a creator, but it's more than one. Number three, someone who says that there is a creator, but is comprised of parts, like a body, etc. Someone who worships idolatry, someone who says that God is not only one. It's very clear here that anyone who says that your soul, or any soul, is a part of God, is someone who is disincluded from our nation. This is serious stuff. These are not things you want to play with. You don't play around with these things. Now, just to banish any thought that there's any legitimacy to this opinion, there are verses that say clearly, there are sources that say clearly that the soul is a creation of God. God created the soul. So, for example, there's a verse in Isaiah, Neshamos Aniasisi, God says, I made the souls. Souls are creations. There's one creator, everything else, including lofty things, like Torah, like angels, like our soul. They're all creations. Only God is a creator. We say in our prayers every single day, Borei Kol HaNeshamos, God creates all the souls. In the prayer that we say in the morning, Elokai Neshama, Shrasata Bi Tahorahi, talk about the Neshama, the soul. Ata Barasa, you created it. Ata Yatsarta, you formed it. God created our souls. They're not a piece of God. They're not a part of God. That is heresy. We don't adopt that opinion at all. There's no credence or credibility to that opinion. That opinion is wrong. That opinion renders a person as excluded from the nation. These are nothing to play around with. The soul is the creation of God. Just to add more credence to this obvious opinion, you see why maybe... We shouldn't even mention it because it's so ridiculous. It's so ludicrous to believe otherwise. But I think it's important to just banish this misconception. The Talmud tells us, this is an interesting Talmud. Again, this is not an exhaustive list of proofs to what maybe all of us really knew as obvious. But because this is a Talmud we're going to revisit later on, I thought it's an interesting thing to mention right now. The Talmud tells us that Messiah will not arrive until all the souls that are housed in a heavenly chamber called Guf, which is a vault of souls in heaven, until all of them are used up. And Rashi tells us that in this vault called Guf, all the souls that were created, that were created, souls are created, from the six days of creation, they're there waiting to be matched with bodies. So again, Rashi tells us, this is just the reading of Rashi, the souls are created. And there's not a single source, by the way, that says the souls are part of God. It's a misreading, it's a misunderstanding, but there's no source to that effect. 
And by the way, the halacha is sensitive to this as well. In the Elokai Neshama prayer that we say every morning, we're told in the halachic sources, you have to have a pause between Elokai and Neshama, which means Elokai means my God. And then you say Neshama, the soul, you have to pause to not give over the mistaken impression that your God and your soul are the same thing. Again, maybe this is obvious to everyone else, but somehow it didn't filter to everyone. We don't pray to angels. We definitely don't pray to people. This whole idea of making God corporeal, of giving God human characteristics, it does not come from our religion. It's a Christian idea. And someone who believes that the soul is a part of, of Hashem, part of God, that is, and I believe, that is equivalent, or at least adjacent, to Christianity. It's total, absolute heresy. And this mistaken idea cannot be tolerated and must be completely banished. And again, I want to ask for your forgiveness because our audience is comprised of very intelligent and educated and capable people. And I'm telling you that on the merits, this opinion should not even be discussed. But because I know that a lot of people, and again, I want to stress, good people, well-meaning people, otherwise educated people, they have been peddling, or at least they have been imbibing this heresy, I thought it was prudent to dispel that heretical misconception. And the ironic or tragic part of this is that the very book that these people are misreading explicitly warned against this mistake. The problem is that the sentence that leads them astray is in the earlier chapters and the warnings not to misrepresent it, misinterpret it, comes at the end of the book, and most people don't read all the way to the end, and what a shame that is. So we know what the soul is not. The soul is similar to God. Five similarities David found for us, the Talmud told us in the book of Brachos, page 10a. But what is the soul? And specifically, how does the soul relate to God? How is the soul similar to God? David tells us our soul in five ways is similar to God, and therefore our soul can praise God. What is the similarity between our soul and God? So we have the Talmud, as I mentioned, in the book of Brachos, page 10a. There are other sources to this effect in the Talmud and elsewhere, that tell us that the soul is similar to God. So we have Brachas 10a, and we have the Talmud book of Nida. Brachas is the first book of the Talmud. Nida is the final book of the Talmud. On page 30b in the Talmud of Nida, we read that before a child is born, the child is adjured. The child must give an oath and say, the following, or it's adjured the following. The soul is told, be righteous, don't be wicked. If everyone tells you you are righteous, consider yourself to be wicked. And you should know that the Holy One, blessed is he, is pure. The Almighty is pure. The angels are pure. And your soul is pure. Again, the Talmud reinforces this idea that some sort of equivalence or similarity between God, the angels, and our soul. The soul, like the angels, is similar to God. God is pure, the angels are pure, and the soul is pure. So the soul is similar to God, and the soul is similar to the angels, but unlike God, who is a creator, souls are creations, angels are creations, the Torah is a creation, they're similar, but not the same. So what is the similarity? Now we know how they're not similar. We know that this similarity between God and the soul and angels and Torah. But what is the similarity and what can that teach us? So I want to revisit some of the sources that we saw last time and see what we can find. So, of course, the verse that talks about the creation of the soul is chapter 2, verse 7 of Genesis. God blew into the nostrils of man, 
a soul, a living soul, and man became a nefesh chaya, a living being. And Rashi told us, and we, of course, saw this last time, that man is a hybrid. The body is from the lower entities, from the lower spheres, and the soul is from the higher spheres. What is the notion of higher, loftier spheres, and that is the origin of the soul, and lower, lowlier things, and that's the origin of the body? What is this hierarchy that we're told man is really a a mix, a melding of the opposites of this hierarchy? The soul comes from all the way at the top. the The body comes from all the way at the bottom. What exactly is this hierarchy? So the understanding, and again, we touched upon this last time, the world must remain connected to the source, the one source of all vitality in life. There's only one power. There's only one independent, true existence. Everything else is dependent Everything else relies on God for vitality. So, for example, we say in our prayer every day, God continually renews Genesis every single day. We don't believe that they might create the world and put it on autopilot, went on to focus on bigger and better things. We believe that the world must constantly be connected to God, to the source of all life and vitality, to the only source of life and vitality, and the world, should it be separate, or really anything, should it be separated from God, it instantly ceases to exist. We, and everything that we know of, only exist so long and in so far as God continually, continuously wills us to exist and gives us this divine vitality and recreates Genesis every single second. But as I mentioned last time, that divine vitality flows through many levels and really veritable worlds until it gets here. We talked about the lights. Remember the lights? This mentioned there's one light, lots of different filters, one filter, two filter, 100 million filters. And as you add filters to this light, it becomes a little bit fainter, but it's still the original light. So as an example, this is an idea that the Ramban brings in his commentary to the Torah, many places, a few times in the Torah. We're told that land, land must exist with a connection to God. Like everything else in the world can't exist independently, it relies on God. Well, what is the interface? What is the connection between God and the land? Well, there's a filter. And that is an angel. The angel is the intermediary, so to speak, through which the divine vitality must flow. And that is the angel that's in charge of overseeing that particular land. So if you remember, we had the battle, the midnight nocturnal battle between Jacob and the angel of Asaph. Asaph, as a nation, there is an angel, so to speak, that intermediates between God and that nation. Land, people, nations, they have these filters through which the divine connection goes through. The land of Israel, we're told, the eyes of God are upon it from the beginning of the year until the end of the year. The land of Israel, we're told, is special in that there is no filter. The divine impact upon this land and upon this nation is unfiltered and therefore it is more direct. It is not weakened. So, for example, perhaps you've heard of this. The idea of the Evan Shasia, the foundation stone, the first stone that God used to create the world. Where was that? Temple Mount. With the creation of land, the Almighty created first the land of Israel. That was where it all started from. That is the navel, so to speak, of the world. 
And therefore, that's the place that has the closest and most direct connection with God, both at the initial creation and continuously with this ongoing Genesis. So we have a land that's special, different than any other land. We have a people that's special, is different than any other people. And that means that the connection is not modified. It's not moderated. It's not attenuated or mitigated in any way. And therefore, you would expect that the land of Israel, the people of Israel, will have better or worse, but more polarized treatment from God because there's nothing that's going to limit, curtail, curb, attenuate that divine connection. And these are very advanced Kabbalistic ideas, but the Ramban brings in his coming to the Torah, and it's a well-known idea and something that we have to understand to understand the subject. Jewish people, land of Israel, there's no buffer, so to speak, between them and God. There's a direct connection. And this, by the way, applies in many different areas as well. So, for example, the Arizal tells us that every fruit also has a filter, every species of fruits, but it's only four species that don't have a filter. And those are the four species that we shake in our lulav on the festival of Sukkot. So we have divine oversight, divine sustenance, and creation, and different gradients of connection between the thing that's being created and the one and sole source of vitality and power. Now the Ramban tells us that during the week of Genesis, there were different types of creation. So he tells us that on day one, that's a different type of creation. That is creation ex nihilo, something out of nothing. The rest of creation, that is yesh miyesh, something out of something else. And the Rabban points out that there are two different words, verbs in Hebrew to describe creation. Bara, to create, yatsar, to create, or to form. Whenever the Torah tells us the God bara, God created, that is something out of nothing. The Almighty wills something that never existed. It's a direct creation of God. Yatsar is also an almost direct creation of God, but it's not something out of nothing. It's the Almighty taking something and repurposing and refashioning it into something else. This is the famous and fascinating Ramban who talks about the original creation, the original creation of matter, and this very, very ethereal creation, he calls it, in the words of the Greeks, it's the Hiuli material, whatever that means, matter or energy, in its most basic primordial form. This idea of God creating something out of nothing, and then using that to create everything else. And again, the higher it is, so to speak, to God in creation, the closer it is to being an original creation of God, as opposed to a creation of a creation of God, that means it's closer to God, and the light is brighter, and the connection is stronger, and further and further away, the light gets fainter. So here's the idea. The soul is similar to God. Yes, it is a creation of God, but unlike everything else, it was created in the fashion of bara, out of nothing, it's a much higher level of creation. And therefore, its connection to God is much more direct. It doesn't have to flow through all kinds of filters from the Almighty Himself until it reaches the receptacle, the actual source, so to speak, the actual recipient of the divine vitality. The soul is similar to God in that it was created by God directly, and it receives its divine flow of vitality from God directly. Think of the soul as one of those things that were created something out of nothing. No filters. The creation, the original creation, and the continuous ongoing genesis, the ongoing creation, there's a direct pipeline of vitality from God not through all those various levels. 
This idea, it's not my idea, this is what the Ramban says. The Ramban points out, again in chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 7, God blew into the nostrils of Adam, the soul of life. He tells us, normally God creates every other creation, most other creations, God creates the material, something out of nothing, and then uses that to create whatever else he is creating. For example, the soul of animals. God formed it out of something else. But the soul of man was not done like that. Even from the angels. God didn't use the angels to create the soul of man. Rather, God blew, so to speak, into the nostrils of man. Meaning, there was nothing separating this creation from its creator. There are no filters between God and the soul. No transpositioning, concatenation, fancy Kabbalistic lingo, no histalshalus. It's a direct, like blowing of a glass blower. Again, not to make the mistake that the soul is a part of God, God has no, has no parts, but it means that the connection between the soul and its creator is of the highest order, something out of nothing, a direct creation, and a continuously every single day, recreation in a direct fashion. That's what the Kabbalists were trying to tell us when they gave us the Kabbalistic shorthand of what a soul is. That's what that misinterpreted book is trying to tell us. And by the way, it explicitly tells us later on in the book, the soul is most similar to God because it has the light of God, so to speak, the influence of God, so to speak, the vitality of God, in the most direct and unfiltered fashion. It was created something out of nothing. It was created very directly, and it is continuously recreated something out of nothing very directly. And the vitality and flow has no intermediaries, and therefore it is kind of the most powerful and most holy and most similar to God thing that actually exists. Now, the Ramban elsewhere in chapter 1, verse 21, he reaffirms this idea that the soul is created ex nihilo, something out of nothing. And again, we have the rule, bara means a creation, something out of nothing. Yatsar means a creation, something out of something else. With respect to man, it says, vayivra, and God created with the term bria, bara, man in the image of God. This is not referring to the body of man, which was created dust out of the earth. It's a reference to the creation of the soul of man. The soul was blown into the nostrils of man. And that's why man is in the image of God, because these things, they are on the, the higher levels, the higher spheres. Of course, the body is created from the lower spheres. But the soul comes from the higher spheres. And that's this crazy, almost oxymoronic creation of humanity. Now, in the aforementioned prayer that we say every morning, Elokai Neshama, with the pause, my God, the soul that you placed in me is pure, which again is one of the hallmarks of the soul, that it has purity akin, similar to God and the angels. Ata Berasa, you created it, with the word bara. Ata Yetzarta, you created it, you formed it with the term Yatsar. There are at least parts of the soul that were created at Nihilo, something or nothing, at a very, very high level. Yes, we're told Ata Yetzarta, there are parts of it, or at least that's, that's what's implied here. There is an element of the soul that was created with the term Yatsar, but part of the soul, an aspect of the soul, was created in the most unusual fashion, in the rarest of fashions, in a way that can only be comparable to angels and God, Atta Barasa, you created it. So if people just amended, they just amended slightly, this is why it's so important to get these things right. You're talking about theology, you better get it right. 
if instead of saying there's a piece of God, which is straight up heresy, you're done, you're out. If instead you said the piece of godliness, you just add that little bit. Well, that's accurate. That's not heretical. That's exactly what the soul is. Now, with this understanding of the soul, we can understand the properties of the soul. And by extension, the properties of the human who is bearing that soul. Moshe, in his final days, tells the people that there's something that's really close to you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart to do it. And the commentaries disagree as to what Moshe is referring to. There's a mitzvah that you could do that's so easy for you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. You already have it. There's a dispute amongst the commentaries. What is Moshe referring to? So the Ramban tells us that he's referring to repentance. Repentance is so, so easy. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart to do it. Repentance is the soul returning to its source. That's something which is so natural because the soul returning to God, that makes a ton of sense. (laughs) The soul is the thing that's closest in the world to God. It's so easy for the soul to just naturally do what souls do. And that is just exist. And if you were the direct handiwork of God, and you have purity akin to God on some level, to be close to God, that's so natural, that's so normal, that's so standard, it's so easy, it's so close to you, that's who you are, that's what you are. Repentance is the soul going to where it's supposed to be. That's where the soul came from. That's where the soul wants to be. That is where It's natural for the soul to exist. We're told that David had five verses of Baruchin Afshis Hashem, let my soul praise God. And the Talmud tells us, why does David say, Baruchin Afshis, let my soul praise God? And the Talmud tells us that there are five similarities between the soul and God. God fills the whole world. The soul fills the whole body. God provides sustenance to the whole world. The soul provides sustenance to the whole body. God sits in the inner sanctums. The soul does the same. God sees but is unseen. The soul does the same. God is pure and the soul is pure. The final line of that Talmud, Yavo mi shiyeshbo heidvarm halalu, let the thing that has these five characteristics come, and praise he, with a capital H, that has these five characteristics. We can have a relationship with God, thanks to our soul that originates and stems from a place of very close proximity to God. In fact, the only way that we can develop a relationship with God is via our soul. Absent the soul, we are completely incapable of relating to God at all. In fact, that's why we have a soul. We have an element within us that's quite natural in the idea of being in proximity to God. Now, I mentioned that this mitzvah referenced by Moshe, on his deathbed, there's a dispute as to what mitzvah he's referring to. The Ramban says, and the mitzvah that's so easy for you, it's in your mouth, it's in your heart to do it, that is a reference to repentance. Rashi tells us a different mitzvah, and that is Torah. Torah is also quite natural. It's in our mouth, it's in our heart to do it. And the reason is because the soul is not the only thing that's created something out of nothing. The soul is not the only thing that God created with the term bara that has no filters separating it from God. In addition to the soul, there is Torah. And therefore we find lots of overlaps between the soul and Torah. 
There are a plethora of sources to this event. For example, the Talmud book of Menachos, page 99b, a very memorable page in Talmud. Says the Talmud, the Torah was given over the course of 40 days. The formation of a person and a person getting a soul is done over 40 days. The soul and Torah are similar. Whoever observes and guards and adheres to the Torah, their soul, which is very similar, will likewise be guarded. And someone does not guard the Torah, their soul is not guarded. Again, similarities overlap between the soul and Torah. The Midrash in Devarim Rabbah 4, 4, tells us that the soul is compared to a candle and the Torah is compared to a candle. The soul, the verse tells us in the book of Mishle, chapter 20, verse 27, Ner Hashem Nishmas Adam, the candle of God is the soul of man. The soul is compared to a candle. The verse in the same book, chapter 6, verse 23, tells us, Ki ner mitzvah the Torah or. A mitzvah is like a candle, and Torah is like the light. The Torah and the soul are compared to candles. Amar Kadesh Baruch Hu, continues the Midrash. The Almighty says, my candle is in your hand, but your candle is in my hand. We have this mutually assured destruction here. I have your candle, you have my candle. Your candle is your soul, and it's in God's hand. My candle is the Torah, and it's in your hand. The Torah is not in the heavens. He might gave us his Torah. We're the guardians, we're the stewards of his Torah. We have his candle. But he has our candle as well. Says God, if you preserve and guard my candle, I'll make sure that your candle is in good shape. I'll guard and preserve and sustain and nurture and nourish and safeguard your candle. If you try to extinguish my candle, I will extinguish your candle. The Torah is similar to the soul in that it too is one of those original creations of God. But unlike the soul, the Torah is in our hands, and we must preserve and guard and adhere to it. Protect God's candle, and he will protect our candle. Now, on a practical level, we find lots of indications that the soul actually is so intimately connected with Torah the soul actually does not need to be taught Torah. So, for example, the Talmud tells us that when a child is in utero, the child knows the entire Torah. And if you read my book, at the very early chapters of my book, it tells us that the reason why the child in utero knows the whole Torah is because their candle their soul has yet to be constricted. The soul is connected to the consciousness of the child. And therefore, if you know your soul, you know what's in the soul, which is the Torah. With birth, the soul is submerged into men. That is not part of a person's consciousness anymore, unless you're able to restore it. And therefore, you effectively forget the Torah. You forget the Torah not because the Torah of the soul disappears, but because your connection, your sensory connection to your soul has now been severed. If the soul was your consciousness, you would instantly know all of Torah. And birth is the supplanting of the consciousness of the person with the soul, and that's been supplanted by the identity of the body. But the Torah, in all its glory, is still retained in the soul. The soul is bursting, completely replete with Torah. So, for example, we spoke about this in a recent Parsha podcast a couple of, actually, months ago already. Abraham knew all of Torah prior to Sinai. 
Abraham knew every part of Torah. But there was no revelation at Sinai. There was before Moshe. The Torah was still in the heavens. How did Abraham know all of Torah? So the Midrash gives us the answer. The Midrash, this is the Midrash Tanchuma, Parshas Vayigash, section number 11. It tells us that his two kidneys became spouting like waters, like springs of Torah. Again, in my book, I explain what that, what, what that actually means. What that means is the soul, the soul is like the Torah. They're sisters. They're both creations on the same level. And the soul innately knows Torah. The problem is, is that we don't innately know our soul. But should a person remove all those contaminants and remove all those obstacles and remove all those coverings, so to speak, separating that person from their soul, if they could restore the situation that reigned in utero, they would know all of Torah. If they could take that soul that's now been submerged down deep within them and bring it back into the consciousness, they would right away know all of Torah. Because after all, the Torah is always there, embedded in the soul. Abraham did it, and thus he showed us a second way to get Torah. Of course, you could go to heavens and pull it down, or you could do like Abraham did and unearth it from within you. Just as an aside, in the book, I don't want to spoil it for you, but in my recent book, Upon a Ten-Stringed Harp, there's a very clever analogy about the two types of Torah study and why it's much, much, much easier to study Torah from without the way all of us have done or are doing since Sinai than the way Abraham did. That's much harder. So the Torah and the soul are intimately, are, are intimately connected they are both creations ex nihilo. And this idea, of course, explains and gives us a lot of insight into the obsession that we have with Torah study. Because the soul and Torah work in a virtuous cycle. And they each feed off each other. As you study Torah, you're actually tapping in to that soul that's always been within you but is submerged deep within you. You're unlocking parts of your soul. And as you unlock parts of your soul, that soul, of course, is already connected to Torah. It's close to you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart to do it. And therefore, you're able to unlock even more soul. And with the unlocking of more soul, you get more Torah, and so on. And that virtuous cycle results in the soul steadily getting higher and higher in your consciousness and you becoming more and more of a pure person. With that elevation upon elevation, your soul is being elevated, your body is being elevated with it, and you are priming yourself for your return trip back home to heaven. So what is the soul? Last time we spoke about the anatomy of the soul the various components of the soul. This time, we discussed the origin of the soul. A soul is a creation. And they were created in the six days of creation. It's not part of the creator. They were created by God. And they are continually, like everything else, being recreated by God. And they come from a very high place. Like Rashi tells us, the body comes from the low parts. And the soul comes from the high parts. Very, very lofty. And they are our key to connect to God and to his Torah. But we're still at the very beginning of our studies of the soul. There are other questions we have to address. But I think now we have an understanding of what the soul is. We will, please God, advance to other questions Namely, what is the nature of taking the soul from that heavenly vault that the Talmud tells us? The soul is housed in. How does that work? 
taking that soul and transpositioning it to life over here? What is the relationship between the soul and the body and the bind, so to speak, that connects the two? What are the effects of our behavior upon the soul? And of course, getting back to our original question, what happens with death and what happens to the soul after you die? And how do the effects of a person's behavior and choices in this world, how does that play out in the subject that we are discussing on hand? This is the way we got into this whole discussion. We're discussing 13 principles of faith and we're amid the concept of principle number 11, reward and punishment, specifically reward and punishment to the afterlife. We've identified the part of ourselves that's going to be extant in the afterlife, even though we still talk about the role of the body, because that still exists in some capacity. Of course, we have the upcoming principle, principle number 13, which is the idea of the resurrection. So the body or some form of that is going to reappear. But we have a firm basis, I hope. But the discussion must continue. Until next time, from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. This is Torah 101. And the reason why we should call it Torah 101 is because these concepts are really lofty. And the Talmud tells us that it is completely dissimilar. Someone who studies their Torah 100 times to someone who studies it 101 times. Torah 101, the subjects we're talking about right now, you kind of have to listen to it 101 times until it makes sense. But I feel like we did a better treatment of the soul in this episode than we did in the previous episode. But as always, if you want to send me an email, but as always, if you want to send me an email, you know my email address, right? RabbiWalby at gmail.com. I look forward to your questions and your comments and your feedback.